Hello everyone, today I'm going to show you how to render high quality images of your models. So to start out, I'm going to get rid of all these lights that I had up from when I was working on the material, and we're going to start fresh. I'm also going to make a little backdrop real quick for my model. Because I just got rid of my lights though, everything looks dark, so let me turn off the lighting and everything will be back to normal. Let's scale this up. Delete these faces. On the inside, you can see we have the back sides of our faces, but I want them on the other side. So to fix this, I'm going to select them and go up to Mesh Display and hit Reverse. And now the normals are facing the correct direction. Hit Bevel. Raise that up. Add more segments. And just make this a bit bigger. Finally, I'm going to take this, clear the history, go to my layers, and make a new layer for this. And I'll just call this backdrop layer. And set it to reference. So now I can't click it anymore. Now that I've got a backdrop, I'm going to go ahead and add a second camera to the scene. So to do that, I'm going to go up to view and then create camera from view. So now you can see in the outliner, it's created a second camera. And also we can tell that we are using that camera right now because it says Persp one down below. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to render cam one and then I'm going to lock this camera using this button right here so now no matter what I can't move this camera around uh, I'm going to switch to my dual panel layout and then set this one to my render cam and turn on the textures and then from there I can see what my frame will look like if I press this button here to draw my resolution gate. And that will show me what my frame will look like when I render an image. I'm going to adjust this a little bit by unlocking the camera and move to center my axe in place and lock it again. Okay, so now I've got my set camera set up. The next thing I'm going to do is launch the Arnold render view. To do that, I'm going to go up to Arnold, hit render and opens up this pop-up. Right now it is rendering based on my perspective camera. I'm going to use this drop-down menu to go down to my render cam instead. So now I'll always render from this perspective. Right now there are no lights in the scene, so it is just rendering a dark void, except for the emissive material we made in the last video. So what is Arnold? Arnold is a render engine built into Maya, which utilizes ray tracing to generate a photorealistic image. So put simply, the way that ray tracing works is our camera shoots out a bunch of little lines or rays for each pixel that will make up your image. And those rays shoot out into your scene and hit all the surfaces that your camera sees. And then from each of those points, it takes in what objects are around it, what lights are around it, and it calculates exactly how that pixel should be lit in a photorealistic way. So right now we don't have any lights, so there's nothing to look at. But if I go up to my rendering shelf, I can make a directional light with the second button. And it creates a directional light in the middle of my scene. A directional light will cast light in one direction as if it were being projected from the sun or some other very large light source. It doesn't matter where this is. All that matters is which direction this is pointing. And now we can see my axe is lit. If I go to the attribute editor, I can increase the intensity and increase the exposure to get a much brighter light. So this is a start, but it's pretty low resolution in my Arnold render view. 
To increase the resolution and change other settings, I can go up to here. It's the button next to the hypershade. It is display render settings, and that opens up this window. And from here, we can change all sorts of settings for the way our renders are made. Uh, on the common tab, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to change the image size using the presets. I'm going to go down to HG 1080. And that gives us images that are a full 1920 by 1080 resolution. And so that's much cleaner. I can also go over to Arnold Renderer. And from here, we have various settings for adjusting the sampling of our rendered image. Now, sampling basically means how many detail passes will it run through a particular aspect of the lighting. So diffuse has to do with light that is bouncing off of other surfaces. So let's say I added a bright red ball to the scene like so. The red light from the ball will bounce off of it and onto my axe. Especially if we make it a lot bigger. So see, red ball, no ball. With the ball, without the ball. And if I go down to my ray depth, I can increase the intensity of some of these effects. So I can increase the diffuse ray depth and it'll make that red light bounce a lot more prominent. And if I increase the diffuse sampling, the quality of that lighting will increase. And that will increase the time of my renders by a lot. It'll take a lot longer to process, but it will ultimately be a sharper image. Now, if my diffuse were really low, like one, then it'll be a lot grainier in these parts. And if I were to turn it to zero, then we see no bouncing light off of the surrounding objects. Similarly, the specular sampling refers to the reflections, like the actual reflected uh, image on a reflective surface. So if I turn this down to zero, you can see the reflectivity in my axe completely goes away. It becomes a, a very flat and boring surface. But if I turn it back up, the reflections come back. After specular comes the transmission. And transmission is essentially the transparency of your material. So over here, my material, if I turn up the weight of my transmission, those red objects will become clear. And I can even see if I turn around, you can see the axe straight through it. But if I turn my transmission sampling to zero, then the transparency turns off and nothing will be transparent in my scene. If I leave it at a transmission sampling of one, it'll be grainy. But if I increase it to say five, it'll take a minute to get there. And now the clear parts are coming in and it is a lot less grainy. And then after transmission is subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering is essentially the simulation of light as it passes through a opaque surface. Uh, the best example would be how light will shine through a person's earlobes or th through their fingers. I so I've removed the base color from these objects and now it's just got subsurface scattering on it. And if I turn off the sampling for that, the color goes away. At the bottom, we have volume indirect, and I'm not gonna show you that right now, but essentially that has to do with uh, how volumes like smoke are lit. But we're not gonna be getting into smoke simulation or anything like that in this class. And then finally at the top is the camera AA, 
and the camera AA simply acts as a multiplier for all the other samples. So if you just want to unilaterally increase everything, you can increase your camera AA. Uh, there's no magic number for what to set your samples to. Uh, it really depends on the project, what you're working on, and the needs you have of your render. The higher your sample rate, the crisper and less grainy your image is going to be, but it's going to take exponentially longer the higher your samples are to render a image completely. You can tell how long your render is taking down here in the bottom corner. This image is finished and it tells me it has taken 24 seconds to render. Uh, if I move this around, it'll start rendering it again and it'll tell me rendering and I'll wait for a while. And then finally it'll tell me and it'll probably be about 24 seconds again. But if I turn up my samples, it'll take significantly longer. You can roughly gauge the progress of your render, not just with the loading bar down here, but also with the image itself. Uh, you'll find that it renders in squares that work their way out from the middle and spread out to the ends. And so at the far ends, you'll see it's super grainy and it has yet to fully render these. Whereas in the middle, it is very clear and has finished rendering. Generally, when you're working though, you want to keep your samples small if you need to revisit your render a lot and render images over and over. And then you can turn up your samples higher for your final render. Great, so let's get rid of these objects. I don't need them anymore. And let's go back to my render cam. And let's just start talking about lights. So I started with the directional light and let's see what I can change with that. I've already shown you how to change your intensity and your exposure. Those both just adjust the brightness. Uh, you can change the color of your light, any color you want. You can get some pretty stylistic and unnatural colors that way. Or if you like, you can hit this box down here in Arnold, use color temperature, and that will give you colors that land on a very natural spectrum from warm to cool colors. So if you're, if you're simulating a sun or making fluorescent lights, so that's good if you're trying to simulate the sun or get fluorescent light or something of the sort, it's a very quick way to get natural colors. Uh, with directional lights, you can also change the angle of the light, which basically makes it a softer shadow, the higher your angle is. You can also adjust the samples of your individual lights. So just like how you can change the samples for the overall render, you can also change the samples of individual lights. So if a one light is more important than others, you could increase the samples of that light and essentially increase how many times the render engine passes over that light and makes it less grainy. If you want a light source for whatever reason that doesn't cast shadows, you could turn off shadows. You can also adjust the density of said shadows if you just want a faint shadow. There's a plenty more settings to show off, but that's all you need for now. Now let's look at some of the other kinds of lights you can make. Uh, most lights in Maya will work in Arnold, but not every light. So if you go over to the rendering shelf, you'll see there is something called an ambient light and a volume light and neither of these work in Arnold. So if I delete my directional light and create an ambient light, nothing will happen with it. Even if I turn up the intensity to 10,000. Same with volume light over here. You can create it, but nothing happens. These lights were simply built into Maya. And when Arnold came around, they just didn't adjust the functionality to work with Arnold. However, any other light will work with Arnold. So you can create lights from the rendering shelf, or you can create lights from the Arnold shelf. And these are a set of lights that are exclusive to Arnold. If you don't want to use the shelves, you could also go up to create lights and you have your lights here or Arnold lights and you have your Arnold specific lights here. 
However, that's a lot more steps, so you'll probably end up using the shelves more than anything. So going through these in order, we've already seen directional light. Next, I'm going to create a point light. I'm going to trump the intensity of that. And it's pretty dim. Even if I turn up the intensity and the exposure on this point light, it's not giving a lot of light. So to compensate for that, I'm going to go to my render cam. And in my render cam, I can go down to Arnold. And I can give it a higher exposure. So let's give it exposure of five. And that's a lot brighter. So if you're having trouble getting brightness out of your lights, you could always turn up the exposure on your camera. So a point light is, as the name suggests, is a light that emanates from a point in space. It has a lot of lights will share the same settings. So, so color, intensity, exposure, that's all the same. Samples, that's the same. Point lights have a radius setting. So you can make the point that it starts from larger and that will make soft shadows. Next, we have the spotlight, which creates light in a specific cone. So if I turn up the intensity, exposure, create, see it creates a spotlight. And I can move this around, point it down, and then if I want to make my spotlight larger, I can increase the cone angle. If I want to make the outer edge of this softer, I can either increase the penumbra angle to extend it or shrink it, or I can use the drop off to make it a gradient from the center to the outer edges. If I want more of a square effect, I can turn down the roundness and I'll just make a square. Then moving on, we have area light. And this is similar to the spotlight, but instead of emanating from a single point and spreading out in a cone, this starts from a square, which you can increase the size of. If I increase the intensity, increase the exposure. You can see it lights up a whole area. So you could like say move this above, and light a scene like that, that sort of thing. Area lights have a pretty wide spread, but you can tighten that with the spread slider. Now moving on to the Arnold specific lights. First of all, we have area lights. Again, this is an AI area light, whereas if you go and make an, another area light from the regular rendering tab, it is just an area light. So the Arnold area light works pretty much the same way as the regular default area light, but it has a few more features. You can go in and make the light rounder, sort of like a reverse spotlight. And you can soften the edges of a otherwise tight spread light. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same thing as the default area light. Next up, we have the mesh light. To use that, I'm going to need to go into poly modeling. And I'm going to make a torus. Give it a shape like this. Turn it around. Now with my torus selected, I'm going to go back to my Arnold shelf and I'm going to hit mesh light. I'm going to increase the intensity and the exposure. And basically what that does is it takes my mesh, hides it, 
and then turns it into a light. So if I move this really close, you can see that the light is emanating from this ring because it's bright as here and down here. Now, by default, when you create a mesh light, it will hide the original mesh. But if you go to your outliner, you can see that you do still have that geometry, but it is hidden when it has the light on it. However, you can, with the light selected, go over to your attribute editor and click show original mesh. And that will show the original geometry that you made the light from. And this is really useful if you, say, wanted to make something that glowed, the emission on your material wasn't enough. Uh, emissive materials are great, but they don't cast light the same way that an actual light source does. But if you were to combine the two by making a material that has emission on it, and then turning that into a mesh light, then you can get a really good effect like so. Just be conscious of rendering times, however, because you can see how long this is taking now that I've knocked my emission up and it's got this mesh light going on. You can see this put out a very grainy image. There's a lot going on here and the, the amount of samples we have are just not enough. So that might be when you decide it's time to turn up your samples. Next up, we have photometric lights, which we could find here. And basically what a photometric light is, is a light source that takes in parameters from an IES file uh, to replicate the appearance of a real world light bulb. So I've already in downloaded one. So we go to here and load it up. I'm going to turn up my exposure, my intensity. And it's working like a spotlight would before, but you can see it has some more detail to the rings. Uh, because the file is basically telling it how to replicate a very specific light bulb in the real world. Uh, these IES files are generally made by light manufacturers. And the purpose of this is more so for things like architectural rendering, where you need to replicate the exact kind of light bulb that you know they're going to use in this building, or things like that. Things that have very real world applications are when you would use photometric lights. However, this could be really useful for animation as well if you want to quickly get a light that looks pretty realistic without having to make too much custom stuff to get this sort of look. So if you want to use photometric lights, I would look up IES files on Google, and you should get some results that way. Next up, we have the Sky Dome light. And this is pretty much blown out of scene. And that is because this light source is coming from all around. Basically, it's created this giant sphere, which is projecting light from every direction on our axe. So I'm going to go ahead and turn our exposure back to the default on our camera because you no longer need that boost because it's blowing out our scene. I'm going to hide this for a minute just so we can see what it looks like in the render. And right now, by default, it's just a big white void. And like any other light, we can change the color. Make it something like that, something crazy. And that's all fun and good, but we're not limited to just a single color. Uh, with my Sky Dome selected, I can go over here to color, hit the checker box, lets me open a file. And from here, I've already downloaded a few images for this. And then from here, I can select an HDRI image. So what is an HDRI image? It is basically an image with 32-bit color, it has a lot more color information, so you can get brighter brights. And it is a 360 image that has been flattened out into a rectangle, which, when it is applied to my sky sphere, will be turned back into a sphere. So when I open it, and I move this aside, we can see 
It has projected an environment all around my axe. And not only that, it, because it's a light source, it is using the value from this HRI image to project lights into my environment. So you can see here the color from everything surrounding my axe, uh, the, that whole image is what is being used to light my scene. And if I don't like where the sun is, because the sun has the highest value, uh, it is going to be my strongest point of light. I can always just rotate this with E and turn the whole environment around. And I think that really kind of shows off the axe head pretty well. Maybe right there. If for whatever reason in your Arnold view, you look at the sun and it looks like a black dot, that's fine. Don't worry about that because when you save this image, it'll appear white. It's just a little quirk of Arnold that with an HDRI image, if the if a certain point is just super white, it'll appear black in your preview. But then when you save it, it'll return to white. So with my HDRI added, I'm going to bring my backdrop back in. I still have my white background, but that HDRI is still filling in light from all around. And you can really tell how the sun is casting the greatest amount of light because the hard shadow is on the opposite side of the sun in this scene. All right, and then next up we have something called a light portal. And this isn't a light like the other ones necessarily. This is more so a window for your sky dome light. So I've created one here, make it bigger. And basically what it's doing is now that there's a portal in the scene, it is only shining light through that uh, light portal. but it still retains all the color information of that sky dome light that I have. Uh, this is really good if you're just trying to light a interior scene. Uh, you can use these portals and put them right in front of your windows and just light your scene that way. And last up, I'm gonna go ahead and delete my, and then last up, I'm gonna delete my sky dome and we're going to replace it with a physical sky. So the physical sky, it's very much like the sky dome we had up before. It is also a dome shaped sky, but instead of pulling from an, an image or just showing a flat color, this actually simulates a real sky with a sun. There it is, which you can move around if you go to the last tab in your attribute editor. When you have it selected, you can change the turbidity which is basically like the kind of the thickness in the air. You change the elevation of the sun. And as you change the elevation, the way the light is scattering in the air changes. So you look at like a sunset color or a midday color. You can of course increase the intensity, the azimuth, slider will change the direction that the sun is coming from. So I could put it over here, drop it down here. And then you can change the tint of the sky. So you could give it something weird like that. And then you can change the tint of the sun as well. So you can see the sky I've made a sort of yellowish color, but the sun is a blue tint. So the light that's actually being cast is kind of a mix of this blue and yellow. It certainly doesn't look very good, but this is just an example of how extreme you can get with these tints. And then if you'd like, you can change the size of the sun as well. I don't think there's any limit to how big you can make this, so. Yeah, it's pretty big. So 
So you can get some really crazy suns going. So that's a really nice way to just create a sky from scratch. Uh, you could, if you really wanted to get into different effects, you could make your own clouds, but that's a bit involved for what we're doing right now. So I'm going to go back and get our sky dome light and we will continue from there. And with those, that should be all you need to light your weapon. I don't really have any requirements for how I want you guys to light your weapons. Other than I just want you to utilize light to best show off your weapon. So however you choose to do that is up to you. I'm going to go ahead and add just another light to my scene. And then I'm going to get into how to actually render my final image and save it. So I'm going to go ahead and create an area light. Turn this around. Scale it up. I really want to light the right side of this just to kind of balance it out and use color temperature make it something cool and knock the intensity up and the exposure because this is competing with the sky dome light i'm going to use a very high intensity let's say 20. Maybe knock the exposure up to 10. that's too much bring it back down So it looks pretty good, but it's still pretty grainy in some areas. So I think now would be the perfect time to toy with my render settings again. So I'm going to go into here and I think I want to increase the specular and the diffuse, the camera AA. Let's bring these all up by two. I don't need my subsurface scattering on because there's no subsurface. Same with the transmission, volume indirect. I can leave those at zero because none of those appear in this scene. And I can close that out and I'm going to wait for that to render. And now it has finished rendering. It took a total of three minutes and 35 seconds. And I think this looks pretty good. So now it is time to save this image. So what can I do? I can go down to take a snapshot. And what that does is it basically holds on to that render temporarily. So it is not a saved image yet. But if you were to go out of this mode by clearing snapshot display, you'll go back to your render view and then I could go to my perspective shape. And now it is rendering a new image. But if I open my snapshots library, I can return to that snapshot. But again, this is not saved yet. To save it, go up to file and hit save image. And that will open up your images folder. You can then give it a name. I'll name this X1. Be extra sure to give it a file extension. It doesn't automatically assign it a file extension. So you have to make it a JPEG or a PNG or an EXR, for example, or a TIFF. Any of those file formats will do, just so long as you give it some sort of extension. For this assignment, I'm fine with JPEGs or PNGs, but in the future, you might be asked to make some other file extension. Go ahead and click Save, and it saves your image. Before you close anything out, make sure to go to your images folder and make sure you have your image saved. And that's how you make rendered images in Maya using Arnold. So thank you very much for sticking around and I'll see you in the next video.